Okay, thank you. So this, uh, this topic is, uh, is Scheinflug imaging of uh, Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy, which is a condition we see a lot of at, at Mayo Clinic and uh, do a lot of research on. So I have no disclosures. So these are, these are Scheinflug images. They look like slit lamp images. Um, and the question is, which of these corneas have Fuchs dystrophy? So uh, you can take your pick yourself. Uh, but I'm going to tell you that um, you cannot make a diagnosis of Fuchs dystrophy just looking at Scheinflug images. Um, so it's a trick question. This is a better question. All of these corneas have Fuchs dystrophy. Which, which ones have clinically important disease? And I think it should be obvious that these two over here have thick corneas, and you can see corneal edema present in the slit beam. But I'm going to tell you that this cornea that's thin, thinner than average, and this cornea that's thicker than average, neither of them look like they have corneal edema, but both of them do. And you have to do tomographic analyses of these corneas to understand that, and that's what I'm going to show you. The answer is all in the back surface of the cornea. In Scheinflug imaging, which uh, is otherwise known as the pentacam, uh, Scheinflug imaging allows you to uh, map the elevation of the back surface of the cornea and that's the surface that changes first in Fuchs dystrophy. When you measure the uh, power of the back surface of the cornea, it changes in moderate and advanced Fuchs dystrophy. And when you measure the toricity or the astigmatism on the back surface, that also changes. Okay, and that's actually important because you should not be placing toric lenses in these eyes. This is, um, these are the tomographic maps that you get from the Scheinflug uh, imaging device. And this is of a normal cornea. And this here is the corneal thickness map, which is derived from the elevation maps of the anterior and posterior surfaces. And this is a normal corneal thickness map, which has uh, circular, almost circular, or very slightly oval isopacks. Isopacks are lines that join points of equal thickness. And these isopacks are pretty concentric and parallel to each other. This round small circle here is the thinnest point of the cornea, which should be central or very slightly infratemporal. Then this map over here is the posterior elevation map. Uh, and this is quite homogeneous in this, in this normal eye. Uh, there's no obvious um, abnormality. This is a cornea, though, with Fuchs dystrophy. And what's changed here is that the isopacks, the lines joining points of equal thickness, are now very irregular. OK, they're no longer circular or concentric. The thinnest point of the cornea is now displaced nasally. That's, that's abnormal. And it's displaced nasally because the posterior surface of the cornea is now displaced towards the anterior chamber. It's bulging towards the anterior chamber. And that's because there's an area of corneal edema right here. And the tomography system here can detect this corneal edema before you see it at the slit lamp. So these are the loss of parallel isopacks, displacement of the thinnest point of the cornea, and then focal depression. Those are the three factors that we now look at tomographically in these patients. So here's case number one. This patient is 56-year-old with blurred vision, has been told she has amblyopia, has minimal cataract, and she has very abnormal corneal thickness maps, posterior depression. Uh, she has corneal gute, best corrected vision of 2060. It's a thin cornea. But I did a DMEX surgery with cataract surgery, and now she sees 2020, and her cornea is very thin, okay, thinner than average, but she sees well. The second patient, same kind of thing, minimal cataract, Fuchs dystrophy has subtle irregularity of these corneal thickness and posterior elevation maps. Corneal thickness, slightly thicker than average. This patient also had a DMEC with cataract surgery. Now the maps are more normal, um, and the cornea is thinner. And then this patient actually has a thicker cornea, thicker than average. The vision is 2030, has more cataract, has Fuchs dystrophy, but these maps are normal. If anything, there's posterior elevation, not depression. I did do a DMEC on this patient, and I got very marginal improvement. Vision is now 20-20, but 
but the maps didn't change very much. There's a slight improvement in corneal thickness, but not by a lot. So for the other eye of this patient, which had pretty much the same types of corneal maps, I just did cataract surgery and this patient sees 2020 four years later with minimal change in corneal thickness. So what does this mean? It means that we've, we are now classifying Fuchs dystrophy differently. Um, we use tomography to do this and it's simple. It's either Fuchs dystrophy with clinically definite edema, which means you see the edema at the slit lamp. If you do not see edema, it's, it might be Fuchs with subclinical edema, and you detect that using tomography, looking for those patterns I showed you. And then there's a group of Fuchs that has no tomographic edema. And this is all independent of central corneal thickness. We don't look at the absolute thickness anymore. We look at the thickness map pattern. We followed this up and we applied this classification to a group of 96 eyes. And these patients were followed for a median of five years. And they have a range of severity of Fuchs dystrophy. And you can see this group here, this group six, all has corneal edema and their uh, tomography maps are abnormal. But there's also abnormalities in these milder grades of Fuchs dystrophy as well. This is, this is what's important, is when you look at those three parameters, each of them independently uh, predicts progression of the disease over a five-year period. When you look at central corneal thickness, this is not predictive. Okay, so the tomography maps are much more highly predictive than just measuring central thickness. You have to actually do a multivariable analysis to look at these factors, and when you do that, these are the two that jump out as, as independently significant. Again, it's loss of isopax, regular isopax, displacement of the thinnest point. Central corneal thickness is statistically significant, but clinically this, this value here, the hazard ratio, is very low. So clinically it's of very low importance. This is actually important. We're often faced with do we remove the cataract in Fuchs dystrophy or do we remove the cataract and do endothelial keratoplasty? And often that's been a subjective judgment call. Well, now we have some objective evidence to say, look at the tomography. If you have three abnormal features, there's a 90% chance that that cornea will progress in the next five years. If you have none of the features present, there's only a 7% risk of progression. And this is in the setting of cataract surgery. It's almost the same. If none of those features are present, they have a low risk of progressing. And it was, it's fair to take the cataract out without doing endothelial keratoplasty. So this is, these are old classifications of this disease. This, this was great when we did penetrating keratoplasty. We don't do that anymore. Uh, so this classification is no longer valid. We still grade GUTE from a research perspective using this morphology, but it's subjective. There's not good agreement, and it doesn't really talk about subtle or subclinical corneal edema. And endothelial imaging using specular microscopy does not help in this disease for a variety of reasons. And central corneal thickness by itself is not helpful. It's a change in thickness that is more helpful. And the textbooks need to be revised and rewritten as well, uh, as these can often be misleading. This is what we recommend now. It's the pachymetric uh, tomographic uh, analysis using shine plug imaging. And the bottom line is, if you see corneal edema, you know that patient needs treatment. But when you don't see corneal edema, get tomography and look for it because it might be there, and if it's there, it's telling you their risk of progression or their risk of progression after cataract surgery. So it's a revised classification. It's easy to do if you have the imaging available to you. Um, it predicts the prognosis. We've also shown it's very repeatable, um, and it's going to be very important as we move towards clinical trials for this condition. So I'd like to thank you for your time. So what do you suggest, uh, do we simply depend on the shame plug image or we combine it with the specular microscopy to take the decision? 
Um, I don't do specular microscopy for these eyes because the gute, you know, there's regional variation as to whether you're going to see cells. Um, and and um, you'll, therefore you'll have sampling errors. So, you know, the image I showed you of specular microscopy, it de depending on how, where you measure and how you measure, you're going to get multiple different answers. It, it doesn't help me at all. Okay. Thank you so much for a very uh, uh, interesting talk. Can we uh, get the similar kind of information from the OptoView? Because we have more OptoView in, uh, installations here. Yeah, that, I think that's a good question. I mean, the theoretically, this should be able to be done by, by OCT. Um, I'm not aware if, if does the OptoView allow you to generate a thickness map? Yes, it, it, does. it does. It has a corneal map too. Then, then theoretically it should, yeah, we, we don't have the OptoView, we don't use it, but theoretically it should give you the same patterns and it's, it's to be investigated. Second question. Uh, any, uh, we don't have so many good uh, corneal transplant centers in India, but the, the number of people are very large. Is there a role for repasidol in these kind of patients? We have uh, Indian uh, generic equivalents in the market now. Um, again, it needs a ra randomized trial to 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 show that. Um, certainly, there's there's people you know doing this off label in different countries. Um, I think it's an exciting area, but we need we need methods to measure the impact of something like repasidol, and uh, tomography may actually give you some parameters that you can objectively measure to see if it's having an effect or not. But time will tell us here. Um, sometimes when, when there is severe edema or especially epithelial edema, the tomography maps are not going to be reliable, but you already have a clinical diagnosis in that situation. So, so, so such medications are not included for the uh, analysis? Correct, yeah. These were all patients that clinically had no edema, no edema. But, but with tomography did have edema. Okay. 